one. Yes. Let's go. Let's go. Yeah. Good morning, Good morning wow, family. How are we right feeling now. this morning? Are we fired up to worship you, bro. What an incredible service. I'm on, so grateful for Tyler and Shay allowing me to preach for the super regional service here. Come and on, uh, man, Tyler and Shay, they got they got pipes, man. They could they got bars. It's been incredible. We had an awesome welcome by the Shrams and an incredible prayer by, by Gilbert. And what an incredible sharing by our dear sister tonight. I just want me to give a, a round of applause once again for, on, for tonight here. And, uh, Come on, bro. Really, really awesome. And contribution by the cereal is so moving. So grateful that you guys are here with the San Francisco family and churches. And uh, so awesome to see how God is gathering mighty men and women amongst us here. But, uh, you know, today we're going to start our sermon off here with an activity. I hope you guys just get the, br the brain flowing again. I know we had a great, we have a fired up service so far, but I want to get your brain, brain juices flowing some more here. We're going to do a little game of true and false. So, you know, when we come to worship the Lord, I want to encourage everyone just to have their cameras on because I like to see people's faces when I preach. I want to know, I want to make sure that you're with me. If you're not with me, I want to see you. I just want to see your face. Put your face on if you can for us, please. Um, but we're going to do a little true or false. So, you know, you can use your virtual hand to say true, you know, or you could just put your camera on and just say true like that. Maybe that's how Tyler's doing right there. Or you can just raise your hand. We're going to do a little true and false. All right, guys. And keep your score too. We have, we have four questions. Let's see who, who gets all of them right. All right. So first question, true or false? Does it take seven years for your body to digest a piece of gum? True or false? False. Okay. True. True. It's true. All right. Second one. You only use 10% of your brain. True or false? Oh, depending on who you are. True. <laughs> Third one, Let's keep your score. Keep, it's going to be important. It's going to be important. Keep your score for later. True or false? A typical cumulus cloud weighs about 1.1 million pounds. True or false? False. <laughs> Keep your scores. On average, true or false? On average, you swallow eight spiders a year in your sleep. True or false? True. Me keep your mouth closed. Amen. How did you guys do? Who, who got who got all them right? Anyone four and zero? Four four and zero. Sweet. Rihanna four and zero. In, in wow. my heart, I did. Rihanna, she went to college. Anyways, so you know, I want to talk about truth here this morning. You know, men have been searching for truth for centuries. You know, Plato says they deem him their worst enemy who tells them the truth. George Orwell, the author of 1984, says in a time of deceit, telling the truth is a revolutionary act. Flannery O'Connor said the truth does not change according to your abilities to stomach it. Buddha says three things cannot be long hidden, the sun, the moon, and the truth. Now the Bible talks about the truth in the New International Version 137 times. But you see the difference between Jesus and the Bible and these men is that Jesus didn't just speak about the truth, he says he is the truth. Boom. This come on in John 18, verse 36, in a dialogue between Jesus and Pilate, when Jesus is on trial and about to get crucified, he says, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jewish leaders. But now my kingdom is from another place. You are a king then, said Pilate. Jesus answered, you say that I am a king. In fact, the reason I was born and came into the world is to testify to the truth. Everyone, everyone on this side of the truth listens to me. What is truth? Retorted Pilate. This morning, 
we are going to do a Bible study on truth. Let's turn to mm. First Peter 3. Come on, bro. Ooh, come on, bro. Let's go, bro. Please, please. First Peter 3, verse 13. Give me an amen when you're there. Amen. 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 Amen, Zeke. Awesome, awesome. First Peter 3, verse 13. It says, Who is going to harm you if you are eager to do good? But even if you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear their threats. Do not be frightened. But in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. Wow. So it's amazing scripture right here that the Bible puts, it takes on the burden of truth. It says it, it actually has to make sense. You have to be able to defend it. And, you, and what you find the truth is in the scriptures. Like Buddhism, there's no concept of truth in Buddhism. People, even to this day, don't think there's a concept of truth. But the Bible takes on the burden of truth. You know, it's so crazy. I was in a Bible study with a guy who went to seminary school the other uh, this past week. And I showed him what the Bible says about what it means to be a disciple, what it means to be saved. And he said, you know what? I simply just disagree. Then I asked him, why? Why do you disagree? This is what we just showed you in the Bible. And I told him, like, please show me where I'm wrong in the scriptures. I showed you nothing but the Bible. Now show me for yourself, what do you think is wrong about this? And you know what he said? He just said, I feel like this is not right. And Ooh. I told him, there lies the issue. Here I'm showing you scriptures, but all you have to show for yourself is your feelings. We live in a world where the truth of the Bible has been lost in plain sight. And the international Christian churches, our church over here, the Silicon Valley, San Jose, we're persecuted as a group, not because of what we do. We're persecuted because we teach the Bible. And many people will agree with what we say, but once we start to apply it, that's when they don't like it. But as Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 8, but we cannot do anything against the truth, but only for the truth. You see, the Christian movement is a movement of truth seekers, but not just truth seekers, but truth doers. In Romans 9, verse 1, Paul says, I speak the truth in Christ. I am not lying, for my conscience confirms it through the Holy Spirit. You see, our source needs to be the Bible. And I want to encourage all of you to check and challenge everything you hear today to see if it's even in the Bible. Because any pastor could come on a Zoom call and fool you all. Even the true and false question we asked earlier, all those answers I gave were the wrong answers. So if you got all four right, you got all four wrong, actually. That's why we kind of look at, I, I can send you my sources. But that's why you actually got to go to the source to find what is actually true. We all love that movie scene from A Few Good Men. Call Jack out, Nicholson bro. versus Tom Cruise. Tom Cruise is grilling Jack. He's like, man, give me the truth. I want to know the truth. And then Jack is like, you want the truth? The truth? Man, you can't handle the truth. And that's the title of my lesson here this morning. Can you handle the truth? Wow, come on. Ooh, we're going to talk on, about bro. hardcore facts on, here man. this morning. Truth. And put me on trial here this morning. Put me on trial. Let the Bible be the judge. And let the Bible allow us to see what is true. It was once said, truth is not for comfort. It's for liberation. And that leads me to my two points. Lies incarcerate. Point number one. Lies incarcerate. And point number two. Truth liberates let's go to hezekiah chapter eight come on bro let's go to hezekiah chapter eight over here hezekiah chapter eight let me know when you guys are there oh i don't do that <laughs> let me know when you guys are there uh give me one second bro almost there almost there okay here, Ole. 
Wow. Almost there, bro. Hey, man, bro. Almost there, bro. Has Hezekiah does not exist in the Bible. I'm, 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 I'm done. I'm done playing tricks. Right? We're, we're, we're gonna talk in my about heart. <laughs> in my heart. <laughs> Let's go to John chapter eight over here. We're not no no more. Let's go to John eight. Better, bro. <laughs> Hezekiah is not in the Bible, guys. See, he's a he's a great character in the Bible. He does not have a book in the Bible. But John chapter eight. Let's go over there. John chapter eight. Let's talk about truth. John eight verse forty two. It says. This is actually actually in the Bible. John eight verse forty two. It says. Jesus said to them, if God were your father, you would love me. For I've come here from God. I have not come my own. God sent me. Why is my language not clear to you? Because you are unable to hear what I say. You belong to your father, the devil. And you want to carry out your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he's a liar and the father of lies. Yet because I tell the truth, you do not believe me. Can any of you prove me guilty of sin? If I am telling the truth, why don't you believe me? Whoever belongs to God, here's what God says. The reason you do not hear is that you do not belong to God. The Jews answered him, aren't we right in saying that you are a Samaritan and demon possessed? I am not possessed by a demon, said Jesus, but I honor my father and you dishonor me. I am not seeking glory for myself, but there is one who seeks it and he is the judge. Very truly, I tell you, whoever obeys my word will never see death. At this, they exclaim, now we know that you are demon possessed. Abraham died and so did the prophets. Yet you say that whoever obeys your word will never taste death. Are you greater than our father Abraham? He died and so did the prophets. Who do you think you are? Jesus replied, if I glorify myself, my glory means nothing. My father, whom you claim as your God, is the one who glorifies me. Though you do not know him, I know him. If I said I did not, I will be a liar like you. But I do know him and obey his word. Your father rejoiced at the thought of seeing my day. He saw it and was glad. You are not yet 50 years old, they said to him. And you have seen Abraham? Very truly, I tell you, Jesus answered, before Abraham was born, I am. Ooh. At this, they picked up stones to stone him, but Jesus hid himself, slipping away from the temple grounds. Well, you guys got to love Ooh. Ooh. Come on, bro. Nice. That's, that's, a, that's a spicy scripture right there. That, that's just a sharp one. Our point, lies in carcer. We're looking at kind of like the end of the movie. We're going to go back to this scripture and see how it started. But over here, we see that it did not really end off well for the Pharisees. There's a dialogue between Jews and Jesus over here. And they say they believe him with their lips, but their hearts and their actions are far from the reality. Because the reality was that the devil was the one behind this whole scheme. And, that, and he was one that was leading them to not believe in him. And just like how some people this morning, they may feel like, man, like I'm not being led astray by the devil. These guys did not think they're being led astray, but it was so clear that right now we are in an information war and the devil wins by telling lies. And that's just the truth, what the Bible says. He's a father of lies. He's been deceiving people for centuries. The lies of following your heart. How many songs have we heard? Like, hey, just follow your heart. If, it, if our parents said, hey, you know, if it feels good yeah. for you, and it confirms it. Just, just, just follow your heart and, and you'll be, man, if I follow my heart the whole time, man, I'll be the most unhappy person. And I, I, man, I don't know where I'll be right now. It'll be, it'll be the really bad spot. The lies are saying, man, anything in moderation is good. Just experience things. Like, man, I don't think it's good to experience heroin for the first time or experience anything like that. Like anything in moderation, that's a lie. How about this one? The lie of the pursuit of happiness. It's in our constitution. It's, it's, it's how our, our country been built. But why do we live still in such an unhappy world? And people, even if you go to third world countries, are probably more happy than Americans because they don't understand, they don't believe in this lie of the pursuit of happiness. The lie that, man, a relationship is what you need. A man or a woman. Like, man, this person is going to be my savior. This person, like once I get that guy, once I get that gal, that's when I'm really going to be happy. But then how many people we see end up unhappy, then even get married, but then they get a divorce. It's a lie. 
even the lie of false religion, cheap grace, and being able to call yourself a Christian, but then not even know the Bible. Like this, this same guy that was doing this Bible study with his seminary school, I asked him to turn to the book of Hebrews. He said his favorite book was the book of Hebrews, but he didn't even know where Hebrews was at in the Bible. Lies. And Jesus is trying so hard, so hard, just being patient, being loving, and try to help them see, but they just refuse to see. Isn't that so heartbreaking? When you study the Bible with people, you study the Bible with your friends, you're trying so hard. It's like, dude, you should, that God wants to do great things through you. God wants to help you. God wants to save you. But you're listening to the lies of the devil, my family, my brothers, my sisters, my friends. We are in an information war. We just have to see the truth. And the devil's trying to take us out. And I believe oh, like all this stuff at a time. Come I on, look down at anybody. I, I believe this stuff at a time before I actually looked into the Bible. It's been an issue for centuries. But we have to ask ourselves a question here this morning. When are we going to stop believing the lies of our hearts and start to believe the truth of God's word? Come on, bro. Why is this so prevalent in our society? Why, why, why is this happening? Well, I think you really see two attributes of the Jews here that I think are, are in all of us at some degree is stubbornness and idolatry. Let's turn to Romans 1. I hope you guys came here to hear the truth. I, I asked you, can you handle the truth here? And, and, and you know, they wanted to stone Jesus for the truth. So, if you, you know, my, my I, I could give you my number later if you want to talk to me, but th th this is the truth of God's word. Romans chapter 1, verse 18. Come on, bro. Why is the world in this place? And why were these people so refusing to look at the truth? of God's word. It's in verse 18. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godliness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Since they may be known about God is plain to them because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his internal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that people are without excuse. For although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him, but their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claim to be wise, they become fools and exchange the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like mortal human beings and birds and animals and reptiles. Therefore, God gave them over to their sinful desires of their hearts to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies of one another. They exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served created things rather than a creator who is forever praised. Amen. Because of this, God gave them over to shameful lust. Even their women exchanged natural sexual relations for unnatural ones. In the same way, the men also abandoned natural relations with women and were inflamed with lust for one another. Men committed shameful acts with other men and received in themselves the due penalty for their error. Furthermore, just as they did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, so God gave them over to a depraved mind so that they do what ought not to be done. They become filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed, and depravity. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, and malice. They are gossip, slanderers, God haters, insolent, arrogant, and boastful. They invent ways of doing evil. They disobey their parents. They have no understanding, no fidelity, no love, no mercy. Although they know God's righteous decree that those who do such things deserve death, they not only continue to do these very things, but also approve of those who practice them. Come on, bro. The treatise of the Christian faith, the book of Romans, opens up by saying how the Gentile world is lost. Then it says how the Jews world is lost. And then it culminates to the end in Romans 3, verse 23, that all have fallen short to the glory of God, but there could be redemption, the faith and the blood of Jesus. And it shows why this happens. It's sobering when you look at this and it's, it's very reminiscent of our society. This was written in the first century. The universe is enough proof that God exists. The fine tuning, the, 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 the fact that we're perfectly aligned that we don't get too close to the sun, we burn up or too far away from that we've all freeze to them. It's so clear that there is a designer of this all. But instead of believing that people choose stubbornness and idolatry they become so stubborn 
that their thinking becomes futile. That means incapable of producing any useful results, pointless. It's like just running in circles. It's like this all, that's what these all like great scientists are doing. These great atheists, like they're just running in circles. There's no answers. Like there's more, there's more, there's just more theories and theories and theories, but it's just running in circles. And because of this stubbornness, instead of worshiping God, they worship something else. Whether it be a relationship, whether it be money, whether it be themselves, their own ideas, their own heart, the pursuit of pleasure, hedonism, the pursuit of happiness, the American dream. There's so many idols. And I think people have like this fear of missing out uh, complex. It's such a huge thing with especially our generation. They call it, it's an actual thing. They call it FOMO, the fear of missing out. But I think we gotta have the fear of missing out with God. Like, man, we're missing out on the great things that God wants to do. We're missing out on the great things that God wants to do in your life. But instead, we're having FOMO with this world and become, we make them idols. But man, there's so much great things that God wants to get, do. And oh, God says, you know, enough is enough and gives them over to a depraved mind. That means morally corrupt and wicked. You know, it says in Proverbs 29, verse 1, he who's often reproved or corrected or rebuked yet stiffens his neck will suddenly be broken beyond healing. And that's a scary spot. Like you, you, like, you ever get your neck so stiff after you sleep? And you're like, you just, you can't, you just can't move. You're just like, and just saying some, some people just like this. Like just, like you just try to help them. You try to help them, you try to help them. They, just, they, they, they literally cannot move. Their neck is fixated on what they want to do. And, and what are the signs of this? What are the signs? It's, it's a hard, what's the sign of stubbornness? It's a hard time of letting go of something. Like, it's just it's hard, it's really hard to let go of this. It's really hard to let go of that. Another sign is like disliking authority. That's another sign, just, someone's just stubborn. Hard to accept help from someone. You know, you see, so let me just help you. Like, no, 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 I got it, I got it. Dude, let me just, let me just help you, bro. <laughs> love, love, love proving a, pro, a point. Try to find a loophole in something. Like, you ever study Bible, so like, man, this, this is what it is. Like, this is the truth. They're just trying to find, whoa, what, is this, what about this one? No, 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 bro, this is just the way to look. Don't, there's no loopholes here. Here's a, here's a good one, too. Escaping responsibility. Not taking responsibility for shortcomings. Here's a really good one. Avoiding information that contradicts what they believe. That's a huge sign of stubbornness. And the biggest one, hate to hear to stop being stubborn, obviously. I don't want to hear that. But if you're here this morning, I believe it's not too late. If you're here this morning, I believe you came here to seek after some truth. But the question comes, can you handle it? Because the lies incarcerate. Let's free ourselves. God's trying to loosen you up today. God wants to free you from this way of thinking. But we have to stop lying to ourselves. We're really good at lying to ourselves. I remember the first time I studied the Bible four years ago. I tried so hard to get out of it. I looked at every translation, King James Version, NLT. I didn't know about the message version back then, ESV. I looked at every translation like, oh, does it really say I have to give up everything? Does it really say I have to repent and be baptized? And I was trying to find a loophole. I was super stubborn, but I was like, man, this is just the truth. The more I try to find loopholes, the more I found like, no, this is a finite point. God wants everyone to come to the knowledge of the truth and be saved. So July 31st, 2016, at the Global Leadership Conference in Anaheim, I got baptized into Christ. Come on, bro. Come on, bro. This is awesome, bro. Come on, bro. Thank God. Even, even after that, even after that, it's a never ending battle to stop believing the lies of your heart. The devil wants you to think you cannot overcome your weaknesses. He wants you to think that you are not good enough he wants you to think that you cannot be pure. He wants you to think you cannot control your emotions. You know, it reminds me of a scene from my favorite show, This Is Us. I love this show. I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a campaign for this show. Everyone has to watch this. It's amazing. It's an amazing show. The right. acting, they won so much Emmys. You got to watch it. Anyways, um, there, 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 there's, there's some main characters there. Randy, Kevin, and Kate. Kate and Kevin, they were triplets, but their other brother died. So they adopted this guy named Randall. Now, Kate was a woman who really just struggled with self-image. She just struggled with just seeing herself 
in a good light. And because of that, she struggled with her weight. And there's a moment where she was gonna apply to college to go to the Berkeley College of Music. It's an incredible um, college. And she did not think she was good enough. She struggled with insecurity and will always beat herself up. But then her dad was an incredible character, incredible guy, Jack, his name was, always told her, You're, you can do this. You're beautiful. You're talented. You're capable. But this annoyed Kate. And she told her dad, I don't, I don't see myself the way you see me. And while she's recording her audio tape for her audition to go in this college, her dad secretly videotapes her when she's in her zone. And she sees them from the mirror and she gets so angry that her dad is videotaping and she hates him for it. But then she comes to her senses as she's angry with her father. It's like, man, all he's trying to do is to help her see the truth. All he's trying to do is to help her see who she really is. All he's trying to do is to help her free herself from incarceration of herself. So then she tells him, don't stop telling me these things. I need to be reminded. I may not believe it now, but eventually I will. Because in reality, she was talented. She was beautiful. She was capable. She just needed to be reminded by her father. But she never on, actually took his word for it. So it imprisoned her for, the, for most of her life. I, I finished the whole season, so I don't know what happens at the end. But so far, she's still in prison. Life. Come on, bro. Amen, bro. No, but I'm afraid sometimes we do this as disciples. We become our worst enemy and start to believe the lies of Satan again. But in reality, all we have to do is to get out of our own way. Because we rely on our thoughts and our emotions, we become a great co-worker with our worst enemy, the devil, and are subjected to his lies once again. This is why it says in Psalms 13, a Psalm of David, how long, Lord, will you forget me forever? How long would you hide your face from me? How long must I wrestle with my thoughts and day after day have sorrow in my heart? How long will my enemy triumph over me? Look on me and answer, Lord, my God, give light to my eyes while sleep in death. And my enemy will say I have overcome him and my foes will rejoice when I fall. But I trust in your unfailing love. My heart rejoices in your salvation. I will sing the Lord's praise for he has been good to me. Psalm 13, a Psalm of David. I don't know if you caught that. You read it carefully in verse four. David, the enemy that he's talking about was his own thoughts and his heart. Come on, bro. That's why it says in Jeremiah 17, the heart is deceitful. Who can understand it's beyond cure. You see, Christianity is a battle of wits. It's a battle for the mind. It's a battle to bend yourself to believe the Bible and not believe the lies of your heart. Your heart may say, you are not ready to answer the call of God, but God says, I do not call the prepared, I prepare the called. Your heart may say, I cannot get over this weakness, but God says, commit yourself to me and I will strengthen you. My grace is sufficient for you. Your heart may say, I can never become a powerful, loving, and self-disciplined disciple, but God's word says, I have given you a spirit of power, love, and self-discipline. My brothers and sisters, it's time for us to stop listening to the lies of the devil, to stop being incarcerated by the information war, but to look at the truth of God's word, to look how you really are and believe that you are powerful, you're a loving, you're a self-disciplined disciple, and let's change the world world for God. Are you guys with me right here? I want all of us, I want to challenge all of us just to embrace this battle. Just embrace it and let God's word dictate your heart and your mind. You see, when you trust God and his word, you can now partake in point number two, truth liberates. Let's break down the truth of God's word. What is real faith? Because there's so many different ideas of what real faith looks like. But we want to get our faith and our convictions from the very words of God. Let's go to the beginning of the movie that we started in John 8. Let's go back over there. So we kind of Come saw on, the end of the movie. And that, it didn't really end off too well for the antagonists. They wanted to stone the Lord. 
what did Jesus say to them that got them so riled up? What did he say that, was, that got them so angry? Well, let's pick up the dialogue in John chapter 8, verse 31. That was Psalms 13. I just saw that comment. Psalm 13. Anyways, John 8, verse 31. It says, to the Jews who had believed him, Jesus said, if you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Truth liberates. This is all that Jesus said. Like these guys, they believed. They believed that Jesus was God. But he didn't give like high five. Oh, awesome. High five. You believe in me? Like now let's go on and win the world together. I think this scripture alone already debunks one of the most predominant false teachings of the religious society that we live in, that we are saved by faith alone. Go here. He said, oh, you, you believe. That's okay. That's awesome. Man, I'm so grateful you guys believe in me. But man, you got to actually hold on to my teachings and then know the truth. That's, that's something that's so special about truth. You can read Come the on. Bible all you want. You can dissect this all you want. You can highlight it all you want. You can underline it all you want. But until you actually do it, you ain't gonna know no truth. It's like a, it's like coding if then statements. First, you must actually hold on to teachings. Then you'll know the truth, and the truth will set you free. But I I thought it would be fitting for us to debunk this wicked false teaching of being saved by faith alone. Let's look at the staple scripture that people use to show that this could be true. Let's go to Ephesians chapter two. Come on, Ole, let's go, bro. Truth liberates. Oh, this is awesome. Ephesians chapter two and verse eight. An amazing scripture from Paul here in verse eight. It says, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith and this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God. Not by works that no one can boast, for we are God's hand you were created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. What a beautiful scripture. It's so true. There's nothing you do, no amount of Bible studies, no amount of preaching, no amount of visitors, no amount of time you read. There's nothing that we're like, man, the first time we sinned, the first time we went against God, would have been righteous of God, God should have stroked us down and killed us. But instead, he's patient with us, just like he was with the Jews, even when we we're stubborn. I look at myself like, man, if I was that stubborn and I'm looking at me from like from God's perspective, like, man, dude, enough's enough. Thunder, lightning, hailstorm, like, dude, you're, but he's patient. That's grace. This idea that we're saved by grace alone, faith alone is a terrible misinterpretation of the scriptures. Because what people say is that they say that the works that Paul is talking about is being is doing the works of what it means to actually be a Christian. How Jesus talks about in Mark 1, come follow me and I'll make you into a fisher of men. As he says in Luke 9, 23, 26, if you want to be my disciple, you must deny yourself. As he says in Luke 14, that you got to be committed. You actually got to count the cost and pay the price and you actually got to give up everything. They say, well, actually, you don't have to do that. You can't use the Bible to disprove the Bible, right? That's, that's kind of silly. You, 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 can't, you can't say, oh, well, because it says it over here, then therefore I don't have to do that. So already, we're, and even that whole phrase, uh, grace alone, faith alone, is a self-defeating statement because you can't have two things alone. It must be either, it's either grace alone or faith. It can't be grace alone by faith alone. That, that's a self-defeating statement. But over here we have to understand the works of the law that Paul is talking about here, he's, the work he's saying, he's talking about the works of the law. There was an issue in the church, as it says in Acts 15. So I'm not making this up. This is in the Bible. In Acts 15, verse 1, it says, Certain people came down from Judea to Antioch and were teaching the believers, unless you are circumcised according to the custom taught by Moses, you cannot be saved. That's Acts 15, verse 1. So there's a certain group of people who are coming to the church and saying, you actually have to get circumcised to be saved, that you cannot just repent and be baptized. You first must become a Jew and be accustomed to the works of the law. And we know this as well, because Romans chapter three and verse 27, Paul says, where then is boasting? The same thing he's talking about in Ephesians. He says, where there is boasting is excluded because of what law? The law that requires works. No, because of the law that requires faith. 
for we maintain that a person is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. He's talking about the works of the law, not actually repentance. And we know this even more if you continue reading, because it's just so important. We got to read things in context. If I showed you guys a, uh, a picture of a guy with like a big knife and just like blood all over his face, you're like, oh my God, he's like screaming and he's like, he just like looks really, really angry. Instantaneously, you guys think, man, this guy's a murderer. What do you, who do you kill? But if I pan out and see the whole picture and there's a bear right next to him, like, man, this guy's a survivor. This guy, this guy is, is, is trying to fight for his life. You see, context matters. You can't just look at something and take it out of context and make conclusions based off what you see because you could be easily fooled. And if you look at the context of this in verse 11, as you continue reading, what does Paul start talking about? He said, therefore, remember that formerly you were you who are Gentiles by birth and are called uncircumcised by those who call themselves the circumcision, which is done in the body by human hand. Remember that at time were Come on, Ole. One way by the blood. So he's, it's there. He's talking about circumcision, the works of the law, totally debunking this. So what is real faith then? What does, what does real faith look like? Let's go to James chapter two. Come on, bro. Come on, bro. Come on, bro. Lay. James two. In verse 14, it says, what good is it, my brothers and sisters? This is the, the author here is the half brother of Jesus, who is a leader of the first century church during this time. He says, if someone claims to have faith, but have no deeds, can such faith save them? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself faith. It is not accompanied by action is dead. But someone will say, and I guarantee someone on this call will say what we're talking about is not true. And James is like, yeah, I know. I know that. So I got you covered. It says, But someone will say, you have faith. I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds. And I'll show you my faith by my deeds. You believe that there is one God? Good. Congratulations. Even the demons believe that and shudder. You foolish person. Man, James was sharp, man. This guy was a sharp guy. Do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? Was not our father Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see that his faith and his actions were working together and his faith was made complete by what he did. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God and was credited to him as righteousness. And he was called God's friend. You see that a person is considered righteous by what they do and not by faith alone. Wouldn't you have it? Only in a world, only in a world that is entrapped and incarcerated by the devil himself. There could be the most predominant false teaching that you're saved by faith alone. And the only time, the only time that you actually find that phrase, that terminology, faith alone in the Bible, the three letter word not is in front of it. Oh my God. Not by faith. Wow. Alone. So who's the liar? Obviously anyone who believes that. Is they're, they're not on the side of the truth. And man, I used to believe that. <laughs> like, am I, you know what I'm saying? I'm not, I'm not looking down at anybody. Like, how many of us on this call believe that you're saved by faith alone before you became a disciple? Oh, totally. Come on, big, bro. Bro. It was big for me. All of us. But it's not in the scriptures. Wow. Oh, my word. So what is true faith? What is true faith? What does it look like? Like what, what does God want people to do here on this Zoom call? What does he expect from us? What does he desire from us? What does he desire from Francisco, from Jahil, from Cara, from Ashley, from Natalia, from Robert Gamble, the coolest name ever, from Jay? Like what, 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 what does he expect from us? From Charvel, Chris Ross, what does he expect? Let's go to John 14. Come on, bro. Come on, bro. Come on, bro. Let's go. Let's go, on, bro. 
This is John, amazing. John 14, verse 5. I only got two points for you guys here, and I'm going to sit down. Well, I'm already sitting down, but we'll pan over to somewhere else. John 14, verse 5. Keep it coming, bro. This, Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where we're going. I don't, I don't know if you came on this Zoom call feeling like that. Like, you don't know where you're going with life. Oh, 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 oh God could, could give you some, some direction here. So how can, we, how can we know the way? Here's a direction, all right? Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth. And like, that's like the most gangster thing to say. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really know me, you will know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him, have seen him. Philip said, Lord, show us the Father and that'll be enough for us. Silly Philip. Jesus answered, don't you know me, Philip? Even after I've been among you for such a long time, Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words I say to you, I do not speak of my own authority. Rather, is the Father living in me who is doing this work? Believe me when I say that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or at least believe on the evidence of the works themselves. See, Jesus believed that you have to actually repent and do stuff. Very truly, I tell you, Whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing and they will do even greater things than these because I am going to the Father. Amazing. What a humble God that we serve. He says, man, whoever believes in me, whoever says they're going to be a disciple of Jesus, whoever heard the message, whoever believed the message, whoever repented and got baptized and confessed that Jesus is Lord of their life will do the things that Jesus has done. Jesus has done amazing miracles, but he said you would do those things, but do even greater things than him. Now that is real faith. That is truth wow. that liberates. Come on. Amazing. Come on, bro. Come on, bro. I think right now, more than a, more than ever, we have to believe the scripture as disciples. Even greater things than Jesus. Ty Tyler preached an incredible lesson for our eighth year anniversary. Even greater miracles. It's the final countdown of the year. It's the fourth quarter. Play the music. It's the Let's fifth go. round. And we need to believe the scripture even more right now. It's not time to lose enthusiasm and lose focus, my brothers and sisters. It is time to gain even more enthusiasm. It is time to be liberated by the truth. The truth is the harvest is plentiful and the workers are few. That's the truth. That's the truth. It doesn't, I don't care what happened last week. I don't care what happened last month. The final countdown, the fifth round, the fourth quarter, the harvest is plentiful if we all work hard for the Lord. The truth is that God wants all mankind to be saved. I don't care that last person wasn't open. That was their fault. That next person, God wants them to be saved. The truth is that we will go from strength to strength until we appear to God in Zion. And it's so awesome to see disciples in San Jose and Silicon Valley get stronger and stronger before our eyes. Come on, bro. Come on. The woman oh, in a powerful way in Silicon Valley. How, did you see the spirit that tonight just, just, just preached with and shared oh, with? Oh, just, come I, on, bro. I remember, I remember the first time me and Snack I was trying to run away from Devo when I oh. saw her. She wasn't trying to come in Devo. I'm like, hey, where are you going? We got Devo. Why are you running? Then you see her just shit like that, like, dang. I'm sorry, Susan, I didn't put you on the spot right there. But it's amazing. It's so great to see Esteban and Charvel raised up to become Bible talk leaders in San Jose. Yeah, bro. Esteban was the scariest freshman I've ever seen in my life. And to see him oh now. Oh, my God. He preached it. It's amazing. Wish I was there. Yeah, I wish you were, too. It's so awesome to see Cara and Michaela raised up to be cold Bible talk leaders. It's Come amazing on, bro. Angelica. I remember being, I remember seeing Angelica. In her first Bible study, yeah. I was like, damn, I don't know if she's understanding anything I'm saying. But she's, she's celebrating her her first birthday. Wow. Gilbert and Jalen start dating. Amazing. Wow. Oh, and good. at the winter workshop oh. 21, oh, unreal. the Shrams will lead and plant our seventh region for the Lord, Contra Costa. Man, God is doing it for wow. things already. Come on. Let's go. Already, on. but he wants to do even greater things. Do you believe this with me, fam? It's not just Contra Costa that's going to get liberated with the truth. Cameroon, the Democratic Republic of the Congo, hope I don't miss say these, these words, Edinburgh, Scotland, 
Lisbon, Portugal, Colombo, Sri Lanka, Boise, Idaho, potato country. I love potatoes, but I'm not going there. On, Philly in, Pen in Pennsylvania, Providence, Detroit, St. Louis, Bahrain. <laughs> Watch out. Oh, you see that? Like, we're, we're moving. The movement is growing. It's growing numerically and geographically. Are you not fired up here? I'm fired up. You'll be a baptized, sold out hey, disciple in God's modern day movement. Wow. wow. This is all the work of the Lord. Truth liberates. Truth is truth. You know, so awesome to see the past couple of weeks to see women come to Christ and get baptized. And I don't think that's a coincidence because November 8th, we're as a collector are going to have our Women's Day, amen. Let's go. I, I, love oh, Women's Day. I always love ushering for Women's Day. We can't usher this time. I was thinking about sneaking in, but that's not appropriate. But I, I, I did I did usher before. I love Women's Day. It's an amazing, amazing event. And to see people like Jasmine Grace Hill, who grew up in the Baptist church, saw they were not teaching sound doctrine. And then she was met as safely by Gilbert. She studied the Bible and she got baptized into Christ for the forgiveness of her sins. Come on, Jasmine Grace. Last week, we saw spiritual twins for the Lord in Silicon Valley and San Jose, respectively. And we saw Jessica Obala and that Natalia Schofield get baptized into Christ. Oh, oh, God. God. Bro. And she saw they weren't true. They weren't really preaching the sound doctrine of what it means to be baptized. So she got baptized into Christ. And Natalia, she grew up agnostic. You see this? You have a Protestant, you have a Catholic, you have agnostic, but the truth liberates no matter who you are. White, black, Asian, wow. yellow, brown, it doesn't matter. The truth is the truth. We are the liberators of the truth. Boom. Let's, Come on, bro. Let's go. Let's push it to the winter workshop. Let's give it all we got. Do like do your best and let God do the rest. God wants to blow it out in this Mars. round. Come on, bro. Blow it out in the fourth quarter. That's the that's the best moments. When you got the buzzer beater time, that's the best. We got we need some buzzer beater baptisms. That's what we got to see. Some buzzer beater baptisms here in Silicon Come. Valley. Some buzzer Wait. beater baptisms here in San Jose. Come on, bro. That's the truth. That is it, bro. Come on. That's the truth. Come on, bro. Come on, bro. You know, the truth is like the sun. You can't shut it out for a long time. You, you can shut it out for a long time, but it ain't going away. I want to close out with this illustration. The story from a painting that was written in the 19th century about the truth and the lie. It says, oh. the lie says to the truth, it's a marvelous day today. And the truth looks up and the sky is the size and says for the day it was really beautiful. They spent a lot of time together, ultimately arriving beside a well. The lie tells the truth. The water is very nice. Let's take a bath together. The truth, once again, suspicious, tests the water and discovers that it indeed is very nice. They undress and start bathing. Suddenly, the lie comes out of the water, puts on the clothes of the truth and runs away. The furious truth comes out of the well and runs everywhere to find the lie and to get her clothes back. But the world seeing the bare naked truth turns his gaze away with contempt and rage. The poor truth returns to the well and disappears forever, hiding there in its shame. Since then, the lie travels around the world dressed as the truth satisfying the needs of society because the world in any case harbors no wish at all to meet the bare naked truth. This morning, wow. we heard the truth about God's word. Please, if you have any issues with what was preached today, hit me up. I, I'll stay on a Zoom call. But I, everything we looked at was absolutely true. Now, what are you going to do after this Zoom call? If you're not a baptized disciple, you got to study the Bible, repent and get baptized. As a disciple, we got to stop listening to the lies of the devil and believe the truth of God's word. Churchill said it best. Men occasionally stumble over the truth, but most of them pick themselves up and hurry off as if nothing ever happened. Will you this morning stumble across the truth and run away? 
Will you this morning stumble across the truth and just dust yourself off? Or will you pick up your cross, count the costs, repent, be baptized, and stay faithful until Jesus comes back? Wow. The question was, can you handle the truth? Oh. Well, the choice is yours, and to God be the glory. Wait a minute. Wow. 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 Wow.